BNC. And talk about area resistance. Where compliance talked about how easy or hard it is to distend the lung, we would call that an elastic property. Area resistance is the op is not the opposite, but is an inelastic mechanism that impedes lung expansion. Um, the symbol for area resistance is capital R with a sub AW, raw. Um, and it's basically down to about the terminal bronchioles, and we're talking really here about airway things, where compliance was either to the chest wall or the lung parenchyma. This is talking more about the con conducting airways. The formula to calculate airway resistance is change in pressure over flow rate, where flow rate is the speed of the gas that's going in, and there's a pressure drop that occurs as you go from outside to inside. Oh, you are a good one. Yes, there is. Volume. Now, <laughs> we we talked about this one, right? I know they are. Yeah, it gets a little bit dicey. Anything with a dot over it means per unit time. But so it's, this is the volume per unit time. Q is cardiac output, perfusion. Why? We can't use P because that's pressure. So they said, well, let's, let's, let's use the next letter, Q. I didn't make it up. There is. There is. If you go back and go to that, that binder that you used the very first day. Yeah, it's always one of those questions, what the hell did I do with it? Um, within there, there's a uh, there's formula, and there's one that is abbreviations. The other thing you could do is look at the, look at the front and back cover of either I think Beachy or um, Egan. The covers have it. I think Beachy does too. Okay. So airway resistance is this inelastic quality that's going to impede lung expansion. The normal value is somewhere on the order of 0.5 to 2.5, very, very low resistance with, with, within the lung itself. So again, how I might pose a question to you, if it requires 3 centimeters of water pressure change to generate a flow of 5 liters per minute, the airway res resistance um, now notice, let me go back here, notice the units of measure there, centimeters of water per liter per second. Here I'm giving you an answer in liters per minute. Oh man. So I got to convert that five liters per minute into liters per second. Does everybody see how I did that? Minutes got to be on top, seconds has got to be on the bottom. And there's 60 seconds in one minute. So it's 5 divided by 60 liters per second, which works out to be 0 0.083 liters per second. Absolutely. It's only the very first one that I'm a rat bastard. <coughs> That's basically what I'm saying there. So now my units are in liters per second. Now I can go ahead and divide my change in pressure over my flow rate. So it's 3 centimeters of water divided by 0 .83, 0 .083 liters per second. 
and I come up with 36 centimeters of water per liter per second. Go ahead. That's why I have it. What do you think about that air resistance? What do you, th what do you, what do you think about a resistance of 36? Let's go back to the previous slide. What's the normal? Wait, it's really high. <laughs> Absolutely. This would be a, a bad asthmatic. So normal is anywhere within 0 0.5 or 0 0.5. So Centimeters of water per liter per second, yes. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's a really high error resistance. Can you can you hold that for about two weeks? It's a, it, to be honest with you, it's actually a hard time getting the air out. But because you can't get back out, you get to have a hard time getting it back in again too. Yeah, yeah. We're going to distinguish between. Um, what we call obstructive diseases versus what we call restrictive diseases. One is a problem with compliance, one's a problem with their air, air resistance. Remember I said, basically, <laughs> what you're left with is one of those two disease states. Oh, then you're really screwed. <laughs> Absolutely. Gil I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, t we'll, t we'll, t we'll talk about my patient Gilbert when we get to that point. Okay. A couple of other terms that we hear that we that I want to introduce. One is the concept of residual volume, and one is this concept of total lung capacity. Because this graph is showing us as we go from residual volume to total lung capacity. What the hell did he just say? What do we call the measurement of how much air we have in our chest at the end of a normal exhalation? It's F and something. Yes, it's the FRC. The functional residual capacity. Have you ever gotten your uh, wind knocked out of you? Yeah. You lost <laughs> FRC. And until you can reestablish re it, <laughs> you have a hard time breathing, right? <laughs> Do this. Take a breath in. Deep breath. Exhale halfway. Now breathe normally from there. Oh. That's awful. <laughs> That's what happens when you have an elevated FRC, okay? Residual volume is the volume of gas that's in your chest once you do a maximal exhalation. So if you exhale all the way down to you can't blow out anymore, that amount that's still in there is we call residual volume. Okay, there's always going to be something there. Even if you get your wind knocked out of you, you can't lose your RV. Functionally, it's always there. Okay. If I had you take a deep breath, deep, 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 you can't take it anymore, that volume then is total lung capacity. So that's the maximal amount. So this is looking from the lungs as much as you can blow out to as much as you can take in. And notice what happens to area resistance as you go from that distance. It actually gets, gets lower. When the airways expand, when you take a breath in, the airways actually become a little bit wider. So because the, that tube is a little bit wider, the resistance is less. Let me say that again. As you take a breath in, the airways become, the, di the, the diameter of the airway is larger. They expand. That expansion allows for air to move through easier, meaning the resistance must be less. On exhalation, the exact opposite happens. They get narrower again. This is why the manifestation of wheezing in patients is initially on the expiratory phase as opposed to the inspiratory phase. Now, a lot of asthmatics during a bad attack, you have wheezing on both, inspiratory and expiratory. Is, is anybody in here an asthmatic, by the way? Okay. We always get a few in the in the program. Either they're asthmatic or their kids are as, as, asthmatic, one, one of the, or both. The problems happen. Okay, so that's that's what this graph is showing us: is that when you take a breath in, as, as you fill up the lungs, the resistance actually goes goes down. So we're 
residual volume, total lung capacity, functional residual capacity, tidal volume. We've got a whole lot of funky names here. How is that possible? It is. Things that might alter airway resistance, anything that gets in the way of the airway. Okay. Remember when we were talking about that inflammatory process that ends up happening when the mast cell degranulates and releases histamine and cytokines and all kind of other crud? The things that happen is you end up having swelling, you end up having fluid accumulation from additional mucus being produced, you have bronchospasm, the, air, the smooth muscle constricting. There they are. Those are all things that are going to cause a resistance problem. Simply placing the endotracheal tube will also do it. I mean, your tube is narrower than, than, your, than your trachea, obviously, so the resistance will, will go up. Okay. The vast, vast, vast amount of airway resistance <laughs> is in the upper airway. Your mouth, your nose, your main stem, lobar bronchi. What doesn't contribute to airway resistance? I'm just, just going to have a question, Najee. Yeah, it's kind of off topic, I'll ask you. Okay. What seems counterintuitive is that the smaller the airways get, the less resistance you have. And the reason is because there's more of them. If you take all the cross sectional area of the small bronchioles, they actually are a whole lot larger than the individual main stem bronchus because they keep dividing and dividing, dividing, dividing as you, as you go down. That's correct. Overall, the airway resistance is less as the airways get smaller. And it's just, that just seems back asswards. Mm -hmm. But it's because there's so many, mo so many more in number. Yes? If you have an artificial airway, and why does it become more resistant? Because it is. You're bypassing. It is. You're bypassing all the nasal concha and all the other stuff. Placing the endotracheal tube. But the overall diameter is less than the surface area that you end up having in your airway itself. Okay. It's, 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 you, you have to look at the big, at the big picture that is, that, is, that is placed there. Just like there was something that was the mathematical reciprocal of compliance, we called elastins. Rat bastards, they got a mathematical reciprocal of something called conductance. You will never, ever encounter conductance unless you work in pulmonary diagnostics. I did my job. I told you what it was. You'll never see it again. Okay? Not on test. Guaranteed. There is something, though, called GAW, airway conductance. Why is conductance G instead of C? Because C was taken for, for something else. <laughs> I didn't make the rules. Forget about it. <clears throat> when gas goes in, when, when gas flow occurs, there's two different ways that it could be, actually there's more than two, but the two primary ones we, we talk about is something being laminar, and something being turbulent. We talked about turbulent flow previously. The turbinates in your nose purposely make the gas flow non-smooth because we want to have contact with the conky to end up having um, humidification and filtration and all that stuff go on. So in the upper airways, the airflow is turbulent in nature. Once it gets down to the more peripheral portions, it becomes much more smooth or laminar. And there is a measurement that you can make that evaluates to what extent gas flow is turbulent or laminar. It's something called Reynolds number. And a number less than 2,000 is laminar, a number greater than 2,000 is turbulent, you'll never, me you'll never measure it, but just, just know that there's this thing called Reynolds number that, that's out there. If you ever go to, into, into heating and cooling and talk about gas flow through ductwork, they, they measure that kind of stuff and take it into account. We don't. Reynolds number. 
This is, uh, you can see it laminar, a nice smooth flow on top. Turbulent, lots of bouncing around on the bottom. Okay. You can tell he's French because he's got his hand in his jacket, you know. Pousse. And this is, an imp this is one of those, again, you'll never calculate, just like you never calculate Laplace, but it is something that you'll have to conceptually take into account. Okay. When well, we're talking about laminar flow, which is in the medium to small airways, further down, the pressure required to push the gas through is explained by this gentleman's law. Um, yeah, and this is what it is. Oh, good God in heaven. So you won't have a calculator? You'll never calculate it, but it's important because of what the individual uh, symbols mean here. V with a dot, what do we say that was, Randy? Um. Yep, you're right, flow rate. <laughs> so in other words, to generate a fast, think about what this says. Things in the numerator are directly related. Things in the denominator are indirectly related. Okay. So V with a dot over it, we said was flow rate. To generate a faster flow, what do I have to do to pressure? I got to create a bigger pressure difference. Hey, that makes sense. If I want to generate um, a faster flow to say maybe generate a cough, I got to have a big pressure difference between what's inside my chest and outside. Eight, eight is a number between seven and nine. It's a constant. We don't need to worry about it. L stands for length. If I want to push a gas through a tube and I make that tube longer, it's going to take more pressure to push it through. Lengthen the tube, bigger pressure changes needed to push it through. That makes sense. I could buy that. So faster flow, longer tubes, both going to require higher pressures. N, don't ask me why, stands for viscosity. Viscosity. What is viscosity? How thick it is, yeah. Ketchup versus water. Oil versus water. Okay. So if something is really thick, is it going to take a lot of pressure to push us through the tube? That makes sense too. Heck, that's easy. Okay. If I thin something out, less pressure is required. Cool. You all know who pi is. It's a constant. Radius. A radius is raised to the fourth power, which means it's, it's going to have the largest effect. And it's in the denominator, so that means it's an inverse relationship with the pressure. Make the radius less, you profoundly need a higher pressure to push it through. Make the radius bigger, it goes down um, exponentially. Pousset's law. Different things are going to affect the resistance of the airway and the pressure required to push the gas through. Length, flow rate, viscosity of a direct relationship, radius has an indirect relationship. That's what we, do, we just talked about. So pressure required to push gas through a tube will be higher if the flow rate increases, the length increases, the viscosity increases, the radius decreases, with that radius being the most important characteristic. Our goal should
should be to reduce the, re the resistance, reduce the amount of pressure difference that is needed to push the gas through the tube. So what do we do to patients? We tell them to slow down. Breathe slowly, nice and laminar. Breathe through your nose, calm down, all is well. Um, simply, we don't do this <laughs> on patients, but in truth, if you were to do a tracheostomy, remove a lot of the upper airway resistance, you do end up having less pressure required. Interesting thing about the viscosity. Normally, when, when we ventilate patients, we ventilate them with a mixture of air and oxygen. There's a, a, a mechanism by which you can ventilate them with a mixture of helium and oxygen. And helium, as we'll find, has a very low viscosity. That's why when you, you know, you go, you're go, being goofy and you breathe in the helium from the balloon, it's like one, one, one of the munchkins, it's because the gas going through your vocal cords has a different viscosity in the process. And then finally, bronchodilation, if I make the airways larger by, re by relaxing the smooth muscle that's constricting them, this is what we do in, with, with asthmatics, less pressure is, re is, is required. But it's the radius that is the key. Because of that factor of four, reduce the radius in half, you increase um, the pressure required by a fa factor of 16 and the amount of flow will go down by a factor of 16 also. So here's, this is looking at taking my airway from a one centimeter radius down to a half a centimeter. Pressure required to, to generate it remains the same, I'm sorry, um, the flow rate remains the same, however the driving pressure goes up by a factor of 16. <coughs> okay, for right now we're not going to necessarily worry about this concept of time constants. We'll come back and visit it over the summer. Um, but mathematically, if I multiply the compliance times the resistance, I get a number. And it's really, we said that compliance was uh, volume so mil uh, milliliters divided by centimeters of water pressure change, right? Change in volume over change of pressure. And resistance was uh, change in pressure over uh, flow, milliliters per second. Everything is less than in seconds. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to ask anything about this right, right, right now. But think about a patient that has um, let's say that they have a, a very high compliance mathematically because they have a, a, a reduced elastins. And they also have some area resistance that's high. Say an emphysema patient who's got chronic bronchitis along with it. That number is going to be very high. That time constant is going to be very high. What that means is they're going to need a whole lot longer time to fill and empty their lungs. So what they end up having is they end up having to have a very long expiratory phase to get the air out. Leave it at that. I won't ask anything on time constants at this point, but we will eventually. Okay. Let's get to some of these um, different terminology some measurements that we can talk about. First one is tidal volume. Tidal volume is basically the amount of air that you move in or out on a, on a resting breath, a quiet breath is what we call it. How much air do you move in? How much air do you move out in, the, in 
in reality, it's not true that the amount you take in and the amount you exhale is necessarily exactly the same, but for our, for our purposes, we'll, we'll assume that whatever you take in, you exhale. How much you take in is based upon a couple different factors. Um, your height, your age, and your gender. Um, but usually it falls somewhere in the area of five to eight milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. What do I mean by ideal body weight? What you're supposed to weigh. What you're supposed to weigh, yeah, or what your body frame says you're supposed to weigh. Okay. Um, we want to base tidal volume based upon ideal body weight, not actual body weight, because the 600-pound biker has a normal size frame under there someplace. The rest of it is fat. If you ever had the opportunity to observe an autopsy, uh, it's fascinating. Did, did anybody have a human cadaver A&P? Yeah, most of us don't. Um, but I saw that there was a patient that I had ta was, was taken care of, and she was probably five feet in all directions, to get my gist. Um, and w w it, was, it was fascinating because um, I had care for her in the ICU and then ended up going to her autopsy. Mm -hmm. So it, the pathologist typically does not have clinical people there who knew the patient's history. So it was kind of nice that um, we both got a... Um, Play, played off each other. But um, the distance between the outside of her chest and her rib cage was uh, about this much. Whoa. I don't think any, I, any of us had lunch that day. It was just yeah. scary. Okay, so tidal volume is what goes on in and out. So how do I calculate this thing called ideal body weight? Well, it's based upon height and gender. There's a formula for females, there's a formula for males. They're kind of similar. Similar. For females, it's 105 plus the quantity 5 times the height in inches minus 60. So let's take, let, and let's calculate out my ideal body weight because I know I'm nowhere near this. Um, I'm about 6 foot, so that makes me about 72 inches. So 72 minus 60 times the quantity 6, because I'm a male, and add that to 106. So 72 minus 60 is 12, times 6 is 72, 106 and 72, 178 in my dreams. <laughs> so then I need to take my 178 pounds And I'm going to put it into kilograms. So divide 178 by 2.2. And we'll, let's call it 80 kilograms. Got it? So then, if I want to look at my tidal volume, I set it somewhere between 5 and 8 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So my tidal volume would be somewhere between 400 and 640 milliliters. Everybody see where I derive that from? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a guaranteed. Because you know what you're going to do over the summer? We're going to introduce you to mechanical ventilation, and you need to put a patient on a ventilator. You need to know what tidal volume to deliver. How do I know? I go back to this. That's okay. What we will do um, next time, well, next time we meet, we have, a, we have a test, don't we? No, we don't. So Monday what we'll do is we'll have a little lab where we'll play with this. Do you actually go through every patient and do this calculation? Absolutely. You really? I've worked on mixed trucks and these guys just do adult, adult, and put the pedal volume in. 
How long are you ventilating for? It's the short you, 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 can, you can get away with it. Um, now, a lot of times we'll just eyeball somebody and go, eh, they're about, they look like they're about a 700 milliliter. That right there. I multiplied it times five. I multiplied it times eight. Okay. Tells me a range in which my tidal volume theoretically should should be. Good God. So far so good. First thing I do is I calculate out my ideal body weight. based upon if you're a female or a male, right? Two different formulas. Similar in nature, but two different formulas. And that'll tell me my ideal body weight in pounds. I then convert to kilograms and multiply five times that ideal body weight and eight times that I ideal body weight. And that'll tell me my range of title lines. Yes, ma'am. Is your final answer just in milliliters? And my final answer will end up being in milliliters. So yep. 400, 400 milliliters to 640 milliliters. Not milliliters. No, nope, milliliters. Okay. Now I know I'm now now I know my, my, my the volume that I'm moving in and out of the lungs. Oh, yeah. so yes. So what if somebody technically isn't like the ideal body weight though? They still, but their lungs are. Still yeah, absolutely. Because okay. their lungs, I mean, the, that 600 pound biker. I'm not going to put something. Um, no, it'll just require more pressure to put that in. Basically, is the bottom line there, because because that because that amount of weight that you have alters the chest wall compliance. To, so to get that volume in is going to re probably require a little bit more pressure. Good question. No. No. There are alterations in how we ventilate patients with emphysema or ARDS or um, asthma, but overall we're still going back to that basic focus. And over the summer, really what we're doing is you're going to initiate ventilation on somebody and we're going to assume it's a normal patient. In the fall, what the second years are going through now is where we're talking about different alterations in disease states because the rules change a little bit. Okay. Well, that was just the beginning. Oh, well, potentially, yeah. Okay. Here's the bad news. When you take a breath in, not all the air you take in comes in contact with alveoli. Some of it is wasted. Think about the air that's sitting in your trachea. It's not go there's no gas exchange going on. So it just sits there. It's called dead space. The symbol for it is a capital V with a small d. Whew, dead space volume. Okay, I can buy that. And the amount of anatomic dead space we have is roughly one milliliter per pound of ideal body weight. So back here I went through and I figured out my ideal body weight is 178 pounds. How much is my anatomic dead space? 178 milliliters. One ml per pound, period. So if I'm 178 pounds, I have 178 milliliters of dead space. So some portion of my tidal volume doesn't come in contact with a gas exchanging unit. Rat bastards. It's the way the good Lord made us. So really what, you're, what, what we're saying here, and, and, and I will tell you that your, your, your anatomic dead space is somewhere, usually about a third of, of your tidal volume. So a third of your tidal volume is wasted. That's energy expended for no gas exchange. 
Well, it's just the nature of the beast. You need to get the air down there somehow or other, and some of it's not going to be involved. Hundred and seventy eight milliliters. Okay. okay. Here's my dead space volume. Alveolar volume. Alveolar volume is the stuff that does come in contact with alveoli. <laughs> Here's where I can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide the whole essence of why we, why we breathe. Don't exchange, you're dead, right? So the alveolar volume, capital A, notice, small a we're going to find is arterial, capital A is alveolar. The volume of gas that reaches the alve alveoli is my tidal volume less my dead space. If I, I know what my tidal volume is, 5 to 8 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. I know what my anatomic dead space is, 1 milliliter per pound, ideal body weight. Subtract the tidal volume, or subtract the dead space volume from the tidal volume, and I end up with my alveolar volume. All these are equations that you will remember. <laughs> will. We will. You will. This is just part of the game. Okay. But wait, there's more. No, no dots. We're just talking about a volume, not a flow, not a movement of gas. Here's one you probably never heard before, respiratory rate. Now notice the respiratory rate symbol. It's not RR. It's railroad. It's F. Why is it F? For frequency. I didn't make the rules, but there they are. Normal respiratory rate somewhere between 10 and 20 breaths per minute. And we talked previously about this concept of IDE ratio, that there is a duration of time you spend in inspiration compared with that in expiration. And normally, it's somewhere between a 1 to 2 to 1 to 3 IE ratio. When somebody gets into respiratory distress, that ratio goes down. It's the freaking respiratory rate. F. Frequency. I just love when nurses look at ventilators and they go, where's the respiratory rate? It's right there, F. Why is it F? Because it is. <laughs> We've seen this guy before. We were talking about rearranging equations. We were talking about relationships being direct and direct. Minute ventilation is the overall amount of air that you move in and out. It's my tidal volume times my respiratory rate. So if I count my respiratory rate, I measure my tidal volume, I can determine my minute volume. Or said another way, if I measure my minute ventilation divided by my frequency, I can determine what my average tidal volume is. All I did is rearrange that equation, divided both sides by F. Are we done yet? No. 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 Okay, so this is the amount of air that I'm moving per minute in and out of my lungs. Ultimately, what I really am concerned about is how, many, how much is going in and out of my alveoli, my alveolar minute ventilation. And that value is somewhere between 4 and 5 liters per minute. This is where gas exchange happens. Carissa. For tidal volume, We determined a range. So why do you know what number to plug in for tidal volume? In this case, what we're going to do um, on Monday, uh -huh. we're going to have a little lab. You're going to measure this. 
you're going to measure this, you're going to measure minute volume, measure frequency, and you're going to calculate an average tidal volume. Okay. From that, you're going to sub. Pardon me? From that, then you'll know what yes. to plug into here. Yes. Yes. We're going to we're, we're going to do an actual measurement. Then, from that average tidal volume you have, you're going to subtract off of what your anatomic dead space is, determined by your milliliters per pound of ideal body weight, and you're going to calculate out what your alveolar minute volume is. Oh my God. Yeah, that's why we're, that's why we're going to do the lab. Okay. Trust me, it'll, it'll make it'll, it'll make ten times as much sense after that because you're actually doing the measurements. No. These are these are formulas that you're going to have to not only commit to memory but be able to work with. Because the real life is that these are used all the time. Okay, this now, um, there's a big distinction between alveolar minute volume and just plain old minute volume. And it has to do with the size of dead space that, that you have involved. Here I have the same 8,000 milliliter tidal, uh, minute volumes. However, because the tidal volumes are different in each instance, how we get to that 8 liters is different. And in the first case, depending upon the person's dead space, I may not be moving much more than their dead space volume. That would not be good. Okay. Now if that concept doesn't quite grasp yet, it's okay. Um, it, it, it will as we go along. Okay. Here's the important thing that leads us to all of this. And this is a relationship that you will use over and over again. Carbon dioxide that is inside your arterial blood system is determined by the amount of alveolar minute ventilation that you generate. As I generate more alveolar minute ventilation, as alveolar minute ventilation is increased, the amount of carbon dioxide goes down. we talk about somebody hyperventilating, they're moving a lot of gas in and out. They're flushing those alveoli in and out, and the CO2 level falls. Okay. If I come over and I choke Jason, and I stop him from breathing, and I reduce his alveolar minute ventilation, what's going to happen to his PCO2? It's going to go up, right? Okay, so that is a key relationship that we're going to use over and over and over and over. Minute ventilation is inversely related to the arterial carbon dioxide level. If my carbon dioxide level is, is, uh, of my patient is elevated, I've got to figure out a way to increase my alveolar minute ventilation. How do I do that? Change the tidal volume, change the rate, change the dead space. Oh, that, that goes back to that formula. Oh. There is a rhyme to the reason of why I want you to memorize the formulas. At, a, at the bedside, you may never calculate them, but you need to go know what, what goes into them. So here's my situation. My PCO2 is high because this is low. To make this higher, I make the tidal volume bigger, make my dead space volume bigger or less, excuse me, or make my res respiratory rate higher. Which do I choose? It depends. Oh God, are we done yet? My head hurts. We're done. We're done. We'll, we'll, we'll stop here. We'll pick this up. Um,